I ordinarily refrain from making any personal remarks, but I'll do so briefly this morning. It has to be brief so I don't lose my composure. <laughs> How can I thank you enough for the way that you have loved and embraced my family and made them your own? I lost my composure anyway. <laughs> thank you so much. If you would have told me 10 years ago that in a few short years we'd be in a situation where someone could come to me and lie to my face, and it would be considered my obligation to accept that lie as a truth, and that would even be considered virtuous, I would have thought, you're crazy. But here we are. Here we are in a time where someone can come to me and if I refer to them as sir, and they say, oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman. A growing part of society says that what I should do in response is to say, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, my mistake. One of the most objective, observable, clearly defined parts of a human being is now being refer to or try to be turned into something that is subjective preference. That's the time in which we live. And, and I don't make light of that as I ask the next question. Instead, I use that to bring some context and, and to bring it home about how real this question should be for us. I'm going to ask next. As a Christian, is it always true that you are a Christian? Or are there times and circumstances where it might be said you really more identify as a Christian? For lack of a more sophisticated title, my lesson for this morning is Really for Real a Christian. As we're bringing to the conclusion, our studies together, we spent yesterday talking about being steadfast, immovable, abounding in a work for the Lord. This morning we wrapped that up with, with a, another set of self-evaluations of our life and saying, am I really, for real, a Christian? Is this who I am through and through all the time? Because that's what is demanded of us by God. And the first question we need to look at is, do I know where home really is? Where is really my home? We care a lot about this life. We, we just, we do. It's where we live, it's what we know, it's what's, in front of, what's right in front of us, it's what surrounds us, so we, we care about this life. Peter begins his letter, his first letter, by addressing the Christians as exiles of the dispersion. He starts it off there, Peter, an apostle of Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. He's talking to people, you know, exiles there, pilgrims, sojourners, whatever word your translation uses there. It's the same thing. It's someone who's, who's not at home. Somebody's traveling through a place, and these are people who have now come, they've learned about God and about Jesus, they've become Christians, they've now gone home to places that really aren't home anymore. If you travel on vacation, it, we all pack different ways. You know, some of us can take one carry-on and be good, and, and others, you know who you are, have that scale, and you measure it, and you're it's 50, 50 and a half pounds. You've got to swap shoes out to get it below that 50 pound weight. Sometimes I do that. But if we're going to travel on vacation, if we call an agent, it might be a travel agent. We're not going to call a real estate agent and say, I need to buy a house to move into for a week. We don't take a U haul with all of our possessions with us. We know that's really temporary. We're going to rent a spot, take what we need, and travel light, and that's it. We understand that. And you see where this is going. 
Are we living as if this is home? Or are we traveling light? Do we know we're just here for a little bit? We know the, the parable of the rich young fool, and when, when, I, when I mention that, you know who I'm talking about. If you've been a Christian very long at all, the one who had productive crops and gathered up what he needed for many years, and, and he felt good about himself, and God said to him, he said, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? We, we really sometimes focus so much on, on getting ourselves ready and comfortable here. And that was His focus in life. And the first thing that God, that Jesus says in response is, fool? We don't identify as fools, but if we're not careful, we become them by, just, by what we prioritize and what we live for and what our focus is in this life. We know this stuff. We have to be reminded and think about it and not let it just be something that passes through our mind. It's not enough to just cognitively and mentally understand that this is what the Word says. We have to, as Christians, take that then and make that who we are. The decisions that we make demonstrate a love for whom and for what. And how consistently. 1 John 2, 15, Do not love the world or things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. How important is our stuff in this world to us? Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. These are not new passages to us. But sometimes because they're familiar, we kind of gloss over them and think, oh, I know that already. You can't do both. We can't love both. We can't stretch far enough to hang on to both at the same time. We have to let go of one to cling to the other. What are you clinging to? You know that. And love is a strong word. Let's look at one more passage. You adulterous people do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself, makes himself an enemy of God. And friendship in that, con in that context is talking about, just prior to it, the passions of life, the desires of the world, coveting the things of the world. And wouldn't it be fair to say that sometimes we, we want to be friends with the world? That sometimes that, that draw is there to say, well, I want to serve God, I'm a Christian, but I want to be friends with the world too. I want some of this. It won't tear us apart, but it'll tear us away from God. And it might actually do both. What I cannot do, what no one can do for you, is draw specific lines for you as to what this is going to mean in your life. But each of us have to draw those lines for ourselves. You just have to look at this and say, is this me? Is this a problem that I'm dealing with? How do I face it? What can I do in this life? And what can I do for God in particular? 
And how do I bring that to a place where I'm confident of looking to God and saying, I love you. Everything else doesn't matter compared to you. If we can't say that confidently to God, purely and wholly, if there's something we're not willing to let go of, then it might be that we're not really for real a Christian, not recognizing that everything here is temporary, that this is not our home, this is where we're traveling through to get home. Angie and I are dog people. Uh, we have nothing against cat people. We think you're okay, uh, but we're dog people, and we have a cute little puffball named Dexter. And if I put a picture up here, you'd forget the rest of the sermon because he's that adorable. But if, if, if you've noticed what dogs do when they're ready to take a nap is, is they'll go find a spot and, and they'll walk in circles and kind of pat it down and, and kind of get it situated before they curl up in, in a ball there to take a nap. And, and sometimes, isn't that us in life? We're kind of walking around circles making this place comfortable for us to get comfortable and relax here. That's, that's how we spend a lot of our life, it seems like. But this is not where we should be comfortable. We should, pretty be, we should be pretty uncomfortable here, quite frankly. This is not home. Not for us. Why do we struggle with this so much? It's because this is what's right in front of us. This is what's here right now. But we do. Standing here right now is not someone who's coming to you saying, I've got it all figured out. I'm here to say, be like me. <laughs> that, is, that is not why I'm here. Because I'm up here kicking myself, hitting myself in the head, thinking, how can I get this through my own thick skull? And the struggles I'm facing may be of the same struggles, and we can figure this out together. Because it's hard. Because it's not easy. It's the fight of our life. We keep on fighting. And, and Satan keeps on trying to say, you want this, you want this. This would be a lot of fun. Or this would be better than what you have now. We've got to stay focused on what matters. And it's not what's, in front of, what's right in front of our face, it's where we're headed. Second Timothy 3, beginning in verse 2. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. And, and some of these, we, we read through this and we think, whew, I'm glad I'm going to, I'm not ungrateful, hopefully. I'm not abusive. I'm not slanderous. I'm not brutal. I'm not treacherous. If we look at it again, how often am I a lover of self? A lover of pleasures here rather than a lover of God. And have you ever focused on this one much? Having the appearance of, of godliness but denying its power we need to make sure that it's not about having the appearance of godliness but understanding that, you know, that that power that the saving power of the gospel is the same power that sustains us in which we live and thrive and continue we can't deny that and say that we're a christian I know there are many great places to live, and I would probably feel patriotic about wherever I was born and raised. But I am glad that it was here. I'm, I, I like being an American. I love being a Texan. And, and that's, that's, that's good and well. 
This is not where my citizenship lies. And it couldn't be said more clearly than Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is not here. What does it say? It is in heaven. While we're on the point of citizenship, I'm going to read this. It will sound familiar to you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is not a quote from the Bible. There is no first Americans or, or letter to the church in Louisville, Texas. This, this, is not to, this is not from the Bible. This, you know where this is from. What we find in the Bible is not the pursuit of happiness, but the pursuit of holiness. And sometimes we take our citizenship here and we, and we elevate what we think of as our, our society and, and how we approach the world as a culture, and we elevate that to be on par with God. And that's not to be the case. And the more I think about this, the less I care about politics, the less I get enraged about such things, and, and sure, I mean, I want to be a good, good citizen here, and I'm under the government that, that's placed here to be over us, at the same time, whoever wins the next election is not going to determine the destination of my soul. Where is your real citizenship? Where are you making your home? In addition to knowing where home really is, we have to know we are really going home soon we have to understand that that this that what we have here is not permanent you know, james four fourteen says you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes you have this little hot pot thing that will water at home and you turn that thing on, and pretty quickly you have boiling water, and when that steam comes out of that, it might make that distance you know, halfway up my cabinets or so in the kitchen before I can't see it anymore. It's, it's you, know, you, know, psh, you know, what is that, two seconds maybe, right? That's, he said, that, your life is like that. It's, it's nothing. It's so short. This life is so short. And I don't care if it's a long life that you end up living here. If you make it past the century mark, it's still a very short life. It's just not very long. And if, if I had a, a tug-of-war rope and we stretched it from here uh, all the way over to, to Kane's parking lot, and, and, I, and I took that rope and I took a Sharpie and I, and I drew a ring around this end of that rope, a fine Sharpie, so you couldn't even see it maybe because it's up here. And we defined that rope as our timeline of eternity and that little line around the rope as our life the width of that line would actually be an overstatement on a relative basis of how long this life is versus eternity. If you're a math person, then then that is an asymptotic relationship. If you you graph that, the longer you get to eternity by percentage, the shorter and smaller this basically goes to zero. It's nothing versus eternity. And how much do we spend of this little opportunity we have here to secure everything for ourselves? How much do we spend maximizing that line in sacrifice of forever? That's our perspective. That's how short this is. This life is like nothing. We're going home soon. Ephesians 5.15, another familiar passage. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. This little bit of time we have, we need to make use of it. Now that, it's interesting, if, if you look at the, the Greek word there for time, Greek, in Greek they have a couple of words for time. One of those is chronos, from which we get a word chronograph or watch. And that's more of a generic term for time. That's just, like we use time, it's a generic term that means time. But then there's a different term that's used here. And that word is 
kairos. And that word refers to specific times, like bedtime or harvest time. What he says here is not generic the time. He says using the times, the specific times, wisely. So every moment, use that one. The next moment, use that one. And this idea of making the best use of, I love the translation, New King James, I believe that's the one where, where it used the word to redeem the time. Redeeming, if you have a coupon, that little piece of paper has almost no value at all, unless you have a wad of gum you want to get rid of, or unless you're going to use it as you need to to exchange that for something according to certain terms. And so that little wad of paper only has value based on what you do with it and how you use it. Time is that way. Each moment is value determined by what you trade it for. What are you buying with that time? What are you accomplishing with it? If we waste it, it had no value. So the instruction here is each moment, each one, you take that moment for what it can be used for, you trade that for whatever value it can provide, do that over and over and over again, which is, which is why it fits so well with this idea of careful how you walk. You're walking step by step through life, every moment, using that for the way that's intended by God to be used. What are you doing with your time? I don't often think about how much water we use at home. But when a hurricane is coming, or maybe up here when, when an ice storm is coming, and you think, well, I may not have water available for a period of time. Then what we do is you know, we'll store up some and have it ready. I know the importance of water, but in my, in my history, ordinarily, if I wash my hands and turn the faucet off, next time I turn it on, more water comes out. But in a situation where it's limited in supply, we start to realize, okay, I need to know how I'm going to use every cup of water. I have a limited set. We need to view time like that. We have a limited opportunity to use it. Let's use it well and not assume there's always more coming out of the tap. What helps me think in this way sometimes is think about what am I building with with how I use my time. This limited subset versus eternity, what am I building with it? Am I building a family that loves God? Am I, feel, am I building a family that, that views God as precious? Am I building my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I building up the others around me? Hebrews 10, 24, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is drawing near. This is, we don't have a long time. We see the day drawing near. Our life is short. And, and as we see the day drawing near, we're supposed to be encouraging one another to use their time effectively. And, and he says as part of that, don't neglect being together as the habit of some is. Are you here to build each other up? If right now, if, if, if you are live streaming right now, and you could be here building up your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're not, are you using this moment for what it's intended for? Our time is short. Let's use it. If you could know, or if you were told somehow, before this sermon is over, you have 33 minutes left to live. How differently would you sing the next song? 
how much of your heart would be in that worship to God? In that closing prayer, how much would you be focused? Would you be thinking about what's for lunch at all? What would you wish you would have already done but didn't do? You say, well, why 33 minutes? That's weird. Because if you had 33 minutes, you would want those last three. You would not want me to round down. Those three minutes be more precious than three minutes you've ever had in your entire life. Because you know it's all you had left. How do you know how many you have left? Let's use them well. As they come. Because life is short. We really are going home soon. And finally, we have to know that we will come face to face with God. I feel like this is something that I haven't thought about enough. And as I have, it's, it's been impactful. We, every one of us, will have this moment. Think about incredible moments of life. You think about a birthday of your first child. You think of the day that you became a Christian. You think of your wedding day. You think, I mean, all these things we think of, wow, that was a special occasion in life. There will be no more important or pivotal moment in our existence, I'm convinced of this, than that moment by ourselves, we're in front of God. Each of us will have that moment. Every knee shall bow to me. Every tongue shall confess to God. So each of us will give an account of himself to God. Romans 14, 11 through 12. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people give an account for every careless word they speak. Matthew 12, 36. In that moment, anything and everything that we did to make that moment have as short a list as possible for us to explain or give an account will have been worth it. In that moment, the only regrets we're going to have are the things that affect that moment. And everything that we do to make that moment go well will be something for which we are infinitely grateful and thankful and think, I am so glad I made that choice. I'm so glad I made that sacrifice. I'm so glad I made that a priority. I'm so thankful at this moment that I realized what mattered and what didn't. Nothing going to come close to that moment. I'm going to do an exercise here. This is very dangerous. Because any preacher will probably say, never tell them to close their eyes. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes in just a second. There will be a time when I ask you to open them again, and we will know if you fell asleep because you'll still have your eyes shut, and I'll be looking. So close your eyes. In your mind, I want you to have a blank canvas. You are now an artist. I want you to paint a picture in your mind of what the world would paint as a picture of success in your life. 
if you had the world's definition of success to the greatest degree you think might be possible within your existence, paint that picture in your mind. I'm going to give you a moment. I'm a poor artist, so it takes me a while, so I understand. You got it? Keep your eyes closed. Turn the page on your easel to a new, fresh, blank canvas. Paint a new picture of success as I read from Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. It's a different picture. We need to open our eyes, both physically and mentally. We need to open our eyes and see the picture of success that Jesus paints for life. Success is achieving a satisfactory and desired outcome. What is more desirable or satisfactory than heaven forever? And pleasing our Lord. What picture of success are you painting with your life? Let's close this morning by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall it come to pass the saying that is written, and I should probably yell this, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus, through Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It might be that you're not a Christian. It might be that you are a Christian and you're struggling. Those are different needs. And we're going to sing a song here in just a moment. We call it the invitation song because we are inviting you, whatever your need is, to let us know so we can help you. If, if you're not a Christian and, and you're thinking, I want to live a life 
this purposeful, the way that God defines it. I want to know how to please the God who made me and have a life of meaning. I want to start that right now. We can help you become God's child by showing you the way. And if you're ready for that, to baptize you. You can start over today. If you are a Christian and you're struggling and you think, I've, I need prayers or I want help or I just, I just need to let you know that I need your forgiveness for things I've done that are wrong people, I need to make that right. This is not a time to be shamed or embarrassed, but to realize that you're surrounded by people who love you and want to embrace you and want to help you. Why not do that today instead of some other time? Why, why wait around for a time that may not be there? When you've seen the song, we're all going to stand up, and one of the reasons is that if you're going to let us know, one of the easiest ways is to come to this front pew, and if we're all standing, you won't stand out as much. So don't let that stop you. When we've seen the song, come to the front row and let us know if we can do anything for you.